Okay. Okay, folks, it's, uh, it's that time again. This is Friday noon in Houston. This is another meeting of the Houston Property Rights Association. And of course, as you recall, this is actually being broadcast live and will eventually end up on YouTube and archived. <coughs> this is being put on by the Houston Media Source and uh, we are continuing a tradition here, uh, going back 22 years of weekly meetings of the Houston Property Rights Association. And we typically look at uh, local issues, uh, but sometimes we stray from that and have uh, something more statewide of concern, and uh, rarely we do a, a national issue. So, and I, I'm Barry Klein, I haven't mentioned that yet, that I'm the president of this operation. I want to talk to you about uh, the handouts I've already passed out to you. First of all, uh, Jimmy Dunn, who's a longtime member and supporter, uh, had another letter written in the Chronicle. Jimmy writes a good letter, gets his thoughts over in, in a few words. But I have a few bones to pick with uh, Jimmy's letter, so I thought I'd let you look at it. Uh, Jimmy uh, comes out in support of the Keystone Pipeline, and Jimmy says it's safer <coughs> to have uh, use a pipeline, then use rely on on rail cars and trucks, and uh, I think that maybe that's wrong. And there's another factor to be considered, which is the use of eminent domain. It's true that rail companies have access to eminent domain, and they can put in a, a they can take land and put in new rail lines, but that's rare uh, these days. I think they they're content to live with the lines that they've got. They've even taken out some lines. <clears throat> and of course you can run trains 24 hours a day on, on the tracks that are in place. So uh, I don't think we need to worry too much about rail companies using their powers of eminent domain, but there's a genuine risk from pipeline companies using that power. <clears throat> now pipeline companies have a way to avoid using that power. <clears throat> they can simply pick two or three routes and then use a technique called reverse auctions in which they would ask the farmers and ranchers that own the land where they want to put the pipeline uh, what the lowest price would be that they would accept to let that line be passed through their property. And then the, that series of property owners uh, who uh, offer the smallest amount in toto, they would get the project. <coughs> That's slower though, uh, if you have to rely on people agreeing to go along with your project, so the pipeline companies prefer, I think, uh, to use eminent domain. So that's a genuine risk, which I think is very high, that we're gonna find an, a needless and abusive use of eminent domain. But there's also the issue of risk. If a pipeline breaks, what happens then? Well, uh, in the case of the, uh, of the um, um, that bizarre form of petroleum that they have in Canada, which is, uh, has to be heated, with, mixed with chemicals, and then uh, pushed through the pipelines. And apparently those chemicals are very corrosive, maximizing the prospect of a leak. 
and they've already had a very serious leak in a river up in Michigan near Kalamazoo, and they, it's been like months, and they have making no progress on 30 miles of uh, river <coughs> with, a pipe, with that pipeline. Huh? Years? Years? years yeah. Okay, even, even worse than I remembered. Okay, thank you very much for pointing that out. So there's a very big risk you're going to get an intractable, unsolvable environmental risk. And so this is, uh, should be borne in mind. When you get to the issue of uh, train cars or trucks that may have an accident filled with this uh, special kind of uh, petroleum, <coughs> which is it, what's it called, I forget, um, there's a term for it, but it's, uh, I, can't, I don't believe it's very flammable. Uh, you know, we, there's obviously when you have conventional oil in, in a rail car or a truck, uh, that can explode or catch fire at least. And, uh, but I don't think it can happen with, with this kind of uh, petroleum, which is bound up with dirt and soil uh, from northern Canada. So I think Jimmy is uh, wrong on several point points. I thought I'd just uh, point that out to you. But here we have Jimmy to give a, a counterpoint. And he also has a, another announcement. Yeah, the, the issue is not eminent domain. The issue is pollution. And the, everybody wants, a lot of people, the environmentalists want this oil to stay in the ground. They want us to operate on solar power and uh, wind power. <laughs> However, those will not run our cars and trucks. So if the pipeline is not built, the oil is going to come anyway. It'll come by rail car and truck, and it's already doing that. And obviously, trucks and trains pollute the air much more you know, through their own engines than a sealed pipeline ever would. <laughs> so it, to me, the pipeline is the clear environmental friendly choice in, in this matter. <laughs> yeah. So I can say there are uh, also the uh, cost of transporting oil. And another op-ed in the Chronicle showed that transporting a barrel of oil by pipeline is $6 per barrel versus $15 on a, a truck or a train. So, should I, I won't argue with you, go ahead. Can I go into this other issue? Yeah. Uh, there's a really good article in today's New York Times about how the Drug Enforcement Agency is using um, sting tactics to entrap sometimes totally innocent people into a prison sentence for being involved with the drug case, they're telling uh, some of these people to have do have previous records, but they say we have you know five hundred thousand dollars worth of cocaine here. You can come help us get it, and um, you can share in the money. And uh, so you may need to bring a gun because this, there's people guarding this cocaine. <laughs> but in fact, there's no cocaine at all. This is just a story, and they arrest these people for coming along on this deal, <laughs> and. Uh, they get a mandatory 10-year sentence for being involved with some of these things. I guess this mic may not even be working, but um, they call these stash house stings. And some judges are saying this is the government's going too far on these deals, and you, they're turning down these cases. And are there, Anyway, um, they're trawling for crooks in city poverty-ridden areas, all without the I order of suspicion that any particular person has committed similar conduct in the past. So this is a horrible thing that the DEA is doing, and I'm glad some of these judges are putting a stop to it. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay. Any other views on the S? S okay. Pipeline? Comment from Malcolm and then from Lewis. Okay. Regarding the Keystone Pipeline, I talked with the president of the company. <laughs> real close to the Beltway 8 and off the West Hamburg that makes the pigs that go into the pipelines when there's a problem with the pipe and they just cut the section out of it. The pigs actually uh, plug the hole temporarily until they can cut out, cut out the section. And he said that the, they were engineered, the pipes were engineered for that Keystone Pipeline the last five years and in many cases they're lasting between two and three years. That's it. The problem is whenever you're moving the byproduct through that pipe, it's got sand in it, and sand we know was caustic. That's the first problem. And secondly, in order to make it move, as you mentioned, they're putting chemicals in it, but that's not enough. Now they've got to juice up the, the pressures eight to nine times the, the normal rate. So right. if you're looking at the bigger picture and, and hearing 
the whole story instead of the part with the pipeline. It's a water hose. It it it's, it's it's far more complicated than that. So that, that's my point. And and candidly, they're wanting the oil industry wants to start exporting oil. Well, if we've got all that amount of excess oil to be able to export, why do we need theirs if they want to sell it to us? We can sure buy it, but let them refine it and let them do it up in Canada so that we don't have those transportation issues. There are so many uh, rules. A, a, a refinery is very, very expensive, and so the, the oil companies sort of make a calculation. They already have refineries here on the Gulf Coast that can handle <laughs> that. So they want to move it here rather than trying to build a new refinery, and they probably have some pretty serious environmental rules to get past in Canada. Uh, Jimmy's point is that it's going to come here anyway, but it may not. There's, all, there's already talk, I think it's already happening, that they're building a pipeline to the east coast of Canada where they do plan to refine it. Lewis, do you have a comment? Uh, Nancy Pelosi said that this, this stuff has the consistency of clay and it has to be heated in yeah, order to go it does. the pipe. Heated yeah. chemicals, right, and, and pressure, uh, pressurized. My family's had a just sold 162 acres in Simonson, Texas, that we've had since the 20s, and, it, and Seneco put a pipeline over it. No, they didn't ask anybody for permission. They just got the right to do it by eminent domain yeah. about over 50 years ago, I guess, and, and it never leaked or anything, so we never had a problem with it, and no. we had no problem selling it. No. Okay. Um, Pipelines are very safe. Pardon me? I said pipelines are very safe. I'll work for Exxon Pipeline. Yes, they are. Okay, well, but there's still the issue of eminent domain, which is a principle of this part of this, uh, this organization is concerned about. Common question in the back? I think maybe they're going to bury those pipelines because they mentioned an excavation that had already been started someplace. But I'm, I'm reading this book about the Koch brothers. It's called Sons of Wichita. So they grew up, they, lived in, they live in Wichita, Kansas. At least their family did. Most of them did. So they had a uh, pipeline. They, they owned about 47,000 miles of pipelines at one time. And a friend of my son's worked for them when she got out of college. But they, they sold all of them now, I guess, except about it's either 4,000 or 7,000 miles of pipeline they still own. But there was a case where one of these pipelines was carrying liquid butane, which is highly flammable. That's what I think you can put it in your barbecue cooking. But it, was, it had liquid butane in it, and this man out in the country, his daughter, got in her truck to go out with her, her boyfriend. They started the truck, and they didn't know that this pipeline was leaking, liquid butane, turning into butane gas, I suppose. And it exploded and burned into a crisp in 10 minutes. Yes. And they got a 30 and something million settlement against Coke, the Coke Industries. And I, I believe after that, they, they sold all these old pipelines. But they also have to put a solvent in this tar sands, or as they like to call it, um, they don't call it tar sands now, they call it tar oil, to kind of change the perception. Mm. But they're going to have to put a solvent in it. I mean, what is it? Dry cleaning fluid, turpentine? I don't know what they would use as a solvent, but that um, undoubtedly is flammable. And if they're, if they're having to push it through with massive amounts of pressure, and heat and a solvent, if you did have a leak, it would, and if it's underground, how, well, how that, long would it take? Well, that's a problem point. It's been, it's been years since they, that leak in, in, in Michigan, 30 miles of uh, river, and they cannot uh, clean it up. Uh, Steve, you have a comment? Well, if those kind of problems are so significant, uh, why did the EPA approve the whole thing some years ago? I can't tell you. The State Department's already approved Because, it. yes, the EPA and the State Department, I mean, considering what the EPA refuses or denies people from doing across the board so many times, many times on their own private land, to me, <coughs> for them to, write, to sign off on it, is very significant. Well, it may be that the political weight was so powerful that even though they may have had misgivings, they still approved it. We can't, we can't rely on the EPA's decision one way or another to tell you anything about safety. Yeah, when they first proposed it, there was not controversy at all. Hillary Clinton was for it, and everybody was for it, but the environmentalists jumped on it as an issue that they were going to you know, think about. Well, it may be that that accident that in, in Michigan is what alerted them to the, the consequences. 
There's another issue about the highway that's in today's paper. I can tell you about that. Deeds and actions. About the highway from uh, Dallas to Houston, you know? Okay. So come on up here again and see. On the, the train. train. On the eminent domain aspect the of that. There's a difference between a train and a highway. Eminent domain is accepted by everyone, including us, on occasion, right. when it's truly related to a public good. Right. Roads and bridges or something, and somewhere where they're needed. In, in the well, beginning, it was more tied to military purposes, or perhaps uh, uh, processing goods coming in to, to assess the charge, <clears throat> and it's been expanded over the years. Yes. So okay. The, roads and bridges. For the and public to me, good. An interstate pipeline with for a, vi a vital commodity is it in the same category? Sure, and I think it's dubious. There's another article in today's New York Times about the high-speed proposed train from Houston to Dallas. It's favored by both both ends of the route in Houston and Dallas. There's one man in Dallas. He said he drives to Houston every other weekend to see his in-laws for a four-hour trip each way. He likes the idea of a 90-minute trip on the high-speed train, so he's all for it. But they said the people between the two cities are not for it at all. These rural counties don't want it. It's too, it'd be too noisy. These county commissioners say nobody, they don't know anybody that wants it at all. They're all against it. I haven't seen any polls in Dallas or Houston saying that, that we want it. I mean, I, I, I hear about the big ones. Well, probably the mayor. I heard polls. No, it's the city council that was expressed their, their position on that, but, but that's the usual political uh, you know, dynamics at play. Steve. If some idiot in Dallas wants to drive every other week between the two, that's his choice. Absolutely. Nobody right. else should have to pay for it. Uh, yeah. that, that, that guy is not looking at the full cost. <clears throat> and of course, we're, to we we're being told by the proponents that it's all going to be paid for with private money, oh. Japanese money, by the way. <clears throat> And, uh, but I think we'll get to the, uh, the end stage and then they will concede that they need some public help. And they're already putting this thing through the, through the federal process that will eventually let them qualify for our federal grant. Well, they're doing that also, at, you, maybe you're not aware of it, but at the point here at College Station too. They've appropriated the, the, the land and- They've already, they already, they already have appropriated- Working on appropriating the land and rights of ways and everything else. No, that's a going I have not heard that, Malcolm. Well, I mentioned several routes along. Yeah, they, the they actually haven't route. actually chosen the route yet. They mentioned two routes in the arts, one near railroad, and the other one near uh, light pole standards. Go up there. See? And if it's being promoted or done or financed by a Japanese company, I'd be willing to bet they do not sufficiently understand the differences in distance and density that we have in this country as opposed to Japan. So well, I, I mean, I'll bet they understand that. What, what they like about Texas is that we're flat, so it presents with smaller, fewer, <coughs> I guess, um, fewer hurdles to get, to, to get over or around, and that's one reason they, they like Texas. Hey, how are you? Um, let's see. You have another comment? Uh, not on that. Uh, you want to go to the Houston Sports Authority? You want to talk about that one later? Yeah. Mayor, we were going to talk about that. You want to talk about that? Yes, I'm here. Okay, why don't you come out up here and tell us about that? Well, while Malcolm is coming up here, I'll, I'll get to the other handouts I have for you today. <clears throat> one deals with an event uh, taking place tonight. We had a presentation last week about the uh, the, the questionable aspects of the plan to make some major changes to Buffalo Bayou. And tonight, the uh, critics of that project have brought in a fellow from uh, University of uh, California, Berkeley, who's an expert on these matters. And he's a critic of the person that's been embraced by the uh, Flood Control District uh, to design and justify this reworking of the bayou. I went to the website of the opposition, <coughs> and uh, it's the savebuffalobayou.org and uh, read a lot of detail about uh, how deceptive uh, the, the Flood Control District and its related uh, organizations have been about this. At one point, they even blocked the public from coming into a meeting that there were a major, made it really, it's an advisory group made up mostly of engineers uh, were the dominant factor. So it's, uh, it's another, I think, example of the government being manipulated by special interests. 
<coughs> and the ordinary citizen have very little to say about it. And uh, hopefully we can all take a lesson from what's happening. So that'll be tonight. This handout tells you where it's going to be. And I'll tell you right now, it's going to be at St. Teresa Memorial Park Catholic Church. That's on the east side of, of Memorial Park. And as tonight starts at, uh, do I have the time here? Uh, 6.30. 630 to 8, right, okay. It's, it's about a block or two removed from it. Yeah. Okay, why don't you go ahead, Malcolm? About two weeks ago, there was an article in the Houston Chronicle about the Houston Sports Authority wanting to refinance their debt. Now, the debt with the Sports Authority is different than regular municipal debt. And the reason is because the state legislator created the Sports Authority in, authority in like three or four different cities, Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, and Austin. There are other communities that wanted to be able to take advantage of the act, and they said, okay, you can do it too. But essentially, for those major cities, the debt was capped out at a certain amount. If you refinance, and in order to refinance a, a municipal bond, you're not capped out. You can do whatever you want and stretch out the maturities. It ends up costing you more, generally speaking. But in this case, they can't refinance the debt, in my opinion, legally. And I'll, I'll tell you why. They borrowed $13 million from the county. The county has now got it footnoted because it was an illegal transaction. The auditors have said that it's not a permitted asset. And the reason is state investment code tells you it has to be a rated security. It cannot be a loan. The, the uh, county is trying to call it, or tried to call it, uh, an investment and it doesn't matter. The auditors have already footnoted it and said it's illegal. So in other words, they're going to have to create new money in that refinancing to pay off an illegal loan. I don't even think they could do that. And the reason is I think they have to pay off all debt before they could pay off that unsecured loan because it is an unsecured loan. So an attorney and I are looking into it. We're, we're, we're going to see what we can do about it. Essentially, we may just lay the groundwork let the uh, put the county and the county commissioners on notice that we don't believe it's a, a legal transaction. Not only have I said it's illegal as it relates to that loan, so did Orlando Sanchez. He said the same thing. So I've, I haven't talked to Orlando about it. I'm going to talk to Orlando as to whether this is a permitted transaction. I don't believe it is. They, they can refinance as long as they do not add more debt, but if you're taking debt that was given to you illegally that would be it's in order to uh, pay that debt off it is created illegally it cannot be done in my opinion so um, what, was about it? what was illegal it's got to be a rated asset they cannot loan money it's got to be a rated bond and a loan is not rated thank you Malcolm, for that update okay now uh, I think most of you have gotten the uh, emails I've been putting out about this uh, meeting scheduled for Wimberley tomorrow, <coughs> dealing with water policy in Texas. This is organized by Linda Curtis, a very well-known activist from the Austin uh, Bastrop County area. And uh, <coughs> she's in a county which has water, has an aquifer with water. Uh, but other counties nearby don't have that kind of thing. And so the water marketers are trying to make deals in which they buy water from the counties that have it and then ship it to the counties that don't have it but have growth ongoing. And so the water marketeers are dealing with individual property owners and sometimes with the water boards that uh, have been set up in the last several years. Some of those boards are diligent about protecting the water that their county has access to, but others perhaps are not. And so because they're all political animals ultimately so they recently, the city of San Antonio made a, like a $2 billion deal for water over a number of years uh, from uh, water marketers uh, in, ba in Burlington, Burlington, Burlington County, I believe it is. And now there's going to be uh, a very expensive pipeline, like 140 miles built from Burlington County down to San Antonio. And so the opposition to that have not given up. They see a point in the future where they can uh, prevent this from going forward. I think there's like a trial period for the next uh, 30 months or so. <clears throat> and so Linda has organized this meeting for tomorrow in Wimberley to, to, 
decide what to do and decide what they want to push for in the legislature and I guess do other things that would interfere with uh, what's going on with water policy. Well, that meeting has now been canceled <coughs> because of the bad weather that's coming through that part of Texas. So it'll be uh, hopefully in, Dece in December. And I, I would hope to go if I can uh, find somebody else who'd like to go. Now, if I do go, with uh, this last item before you, this uh, handout dealing with uh, water policy and water trading is what I'll bring with me. And this comes from an organization called PERC, which is the Property and Environmental Research Center up in Bozeman, Montana. And um, I was at once at one of their uh, weekend meetings several years ago. It's a free market group dealing with environmental issues, including water and how water should be allocated using a market mechanism. And so I think this is the kind of information that should be part of the discussion at when the meeting is finally rescheduled because obviously what we have now is simply a bad policy in Texas where the uh, water is available to whoever has a, the first straw that gets down to the aquifer, they have a right to withdraw it all. <coughs> and uh, so that's why we have these water boards to try and protect the water, but if the water board becomes politicized, it makes the bad decision and you still have the same negative outcome. So, are there any other announcements or um, questions? I guess not. Let's move on to our, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Uh, what, uh, how, how do you see the differences between people doing oil exploration and pumping the oil to a refinery 140 miles away as opposed to uh, people doing well, water? Well, they have to use eminent domain. The water. If they have to use eminent domain, of course, I don't like it. They can well, no, Let's forget about the eminent domain stuff. Let's just talk about the water rights and the petroleum rights. What's the difference? Well, I think it's the same issue. And, you know, and, that, and Texas went through this back in the, in the teens and they came up with the idea of unitizing the, the oil. And so the, uh, the uh, railroad commission at the time was in charge of allocating rights through pull oil out of those common pools of oil subsurface. Am I correct in that? Right. So obviously something like that, they were already doing that in a way with these little county water boards, but those water boards can be manipulated. Uh, and so, you know, there has to be a free market answer to all that, and I think this article uh, gives an approach on, on how to do that. So, let's move on to our main presentation. Uh, Sarah Guidry is an attorney who works at the Texas Southern University and is in charge of the Earl Carl Institute for Legal and Social Policy, uh, and she also is part of the Thurgood Marshall School of Law. <coughs> What I liked about what I found on the website is that they're concerned about uh, people's property and helping people uh, protect their property and trying to enhance personal wealth. And of course, that's something which is oftentimes neglected by uh, governmental policy is how do you help people enhance their prospects of expanding their personal wealth? And of course, this organization, like I said, is letting people use their talents and resources to make money and expand their personal wealth. Too many uh, government programs interfere with that, including the, the growing uh, requirements for more and more taxes for more and more governmental programs. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to give you Sarah Guidry. Thank you. Um, I am with the Earl Carl Institute for Legal and Social Policy at Thurgood Marshall School of Law, which is on the campus of Texas Southern University. Um, and just by way of background in terms of the Institute, the, uh, in 1947, uh, a postal worker applied to get into uh, Texas, University of Texas Law School. The school denied him and uh, Thurgood Marshall on behalf of the NAACP was filing a lawsuit. The uh, state asked that the court stay the lawsuit while they build an equal law school. So they built an equal law school here in Houston. And um, it would eventually become Texas Southern University. Uh, but once the legislature found out that uh, courts were ruling that there is no separate but equal they stopped funding to the black law school and cut the funding in, into about half. 
And so uh, the school that was supposed to be on the same uh, level as the University of Texas Law School was not and did not have the funding to be. So they were only able to bring in four founding professors. And one of the professors who founded the law school was Dr. Earl Carl. The reason we're named after Earl Carl is that at the age of 16, he began to lose his eyesight. And uh, shortly after that, had to finish high school at a school for the blind. He applied to Fisk University and was denied uh, admission only because he was blind and they didn't know how to deal with a blind student. Uh, but he wouldn't give up. He kept it up and talked to the president, talked to admissions, and finally got into Fisk. He graduated from Fisk uh, with a bachelor's degree of science, and then he went on to Yale Law School. He came to Thurgood Marshall School of Law, which was actually the Negro Law School at the time, as one of the founding professors. And um, he's had a day named after him here in Houston. He's been honored many times over. Um, he was a dean, at least on two occasions at the law school. And so for us, we use him as a symbol to our students that you can accomplish whatever you want, despite the obstacles that you may face in life. So that's kind of our core vision for what we should be and what we should do at Earl Carl. Um, as I stated, the Institute is part of Thurgood Marshall School of Law. We are a research, writing, and advocacy think tank. Um, by way of my, my background, I have been a licensed attorney for about 24 years now, <laughs> to do the math for a second. Um, I've always been involved in public interest, and I became the executive director at, uh, at the Institute about four years ago. So um, we have three clinics, and I'm just gonna briefly mention them and I'll talk more about the property clinic. But we have a clinic where we represent juveniles who are involved in various systems. Juveniles who are having problems at school, who are involved in the criminal justice system, who may be in foster care. Um, and what we do is we provide what we call holistic representation so that we try to bring together all these systems and have everybody working on the best plan for the child overall as opposed to one attorney representing them in one issue and another in, an, in another issue. We also have an innocence project where we represent people um, who have been uh, wrongly accused or wrongly convicted. And um, they have to, our, our clinic is an actual innocence clinic. So it doesn't mean that there's a defense or some technicality you have to have proof now that you're actually innocent. So we look for evidence like clothing and things that can be tested with DNA. And um, it's just amazing. I could talk about that for hours, but it's amazing. You have people who have pled guilty to crimes. You have people who have confessed to crimes. You have people who, uh, who, ha who were the victim of crimes, who uh, were witnesses at trial and uh, it looked like there's no way this person is innocent, and then through the testing of DNA, we found, uh, unbelievably, about 25% of the people who are wrongfully convicted confessed to their crimes, and there's DNA proof that it didn't happen. Um, the clinic that I'm gonna talk about more is our property preservation clinic, and we named it after a woman named Opal Mitchell Lee. Ms. Lee is a uh, very strong advocate for civil rights. Um, she's well known in North Texas and um, very bright woman. I've spoken to her several times um, and I've watched videos, there's a documentary about her. But um, her family had a lot, of, a lot of land and they didn't know what to do with it. And so they never cleared title to the property and taxes accumulated, because nobody knew what their portion was. And so you get this very bright woman who actually has helped people out of lots of jams, but in her own family, they lose thousands of acres of property. And I can tell you still today, uh, I checked on it a couple of years ago, because it's not really much we can do, but still today, there's a case still in court where they're trying to figure out who, who owns what, 
because there were mineral rights that were paid, that, that gas companies had royalties that were paid on the property. So the money has been sitting in a court registry for about seven years now. So what we do is whatever is available legal remedy to help people either obtain or maintain their property. So when we talk about obtaining property, we're talking about uh, typically probate issues. Um, we do every type of probate that's available and, and, um, and in our legal judgment appropriate to the situation. Uh, we do probate uh, administration, whether somebody leaves a will or they don't leave a will. Uh, and the purpose is to try to clear title to the property as much as possible so that it can stay in the family. Um, oftentimes, somebody will be living in a home that belongs to a family, and everybody's responsible for taxes. And, and the other parties may not care to have their interest in the property. Um, so we may do deeds to help them sign over their interest. Uh, another reason that we'll do it is uh, where there's multiple people um, is to also where people are entitled to uh, exemption, uh, it's over 65 exemption for taxes or disability exemption from taxes. So, um, and then on maintaining your property, we do a lot of foreclosure defense and it's foreclosure defense of home, homeowner association suits, uh, tax suits, mortgage suits, and uh, we have a pretty good success rate on getting those stopped just by being able to clear up title to the property. Uh, we remove liens, uh, we help people to renegotiate their mortgages, um, and we actually help families. Sometimes you just sit down and have somebody counsel with them to clear up what the issues are after someone has passed away. And I, I'm sure all of us in this room have had some significant people in our lives pass away. And uh, if your experience is like many of the people that I know, after that person passes, um, the harmonious family that was together at the time of the funeral starts to fracture. And so sometimes it's a matter of just people understanding what their rights are and what their true interest is. Uh, but if it doesn't happen, then you have property, which is wealth, and especially in, in communities of color, that's typically the only wealth, um, go to the state. We have one case right now where we have 72 defendants. And people own just a fraction of the property. I think the smallest amount their portion of the taxes is $6, but they're not seeing anything off the property and they're hearing only on this small amount, so they're not paying. So now we're trying to be filed suit for someone who has been paying the taxes, who actually is the oldest person in the family and kind of uh, the most logical, I think, because there's a way around this. But like I say, when, when, when somebody dies and they leave a piece of property, there starts to be issues among the family. Um, and then uh, one of the things that I find quite surprising um, is that every year we get a couple of adverse possession suits right here in Houston where somebody has moved in a property primarily, typically as a tenant, and then the person who owns it passes away and the family never does anything to uh, acquire, to clear title and, and get their interest in the property. And so the person stays there long enough and they pay taxes, um, then they can go in from, from 10 years to, um, if they don't do anything but live there, up to 25 years, and they can get the property. And we do count as one, uh, as one of our success stories that we feel, uh, we feel is one of the best successes we've ever had is a homeless veteran uh, who had been homeless for many years and had lived off, off and on on this property. And uh, we were able to file a lawsuit and get the city to recognize him as owner based on adverse possession. And then he was able to get disability benefit, I mean disability exemption uh, that stayed and he passed through taxes. He's paying on the pass through taxes, but the property is in his name and the city is helping him with programs um, that will allow him to repair this home. 
And so, uh, and a couple of years ago, I think we hit our peak. In 2012, we were able to either save or obtain $1.2 million in property values for our clients. And I will tell you, our clients, this, this program that I'm talking about has income qualifications. So our clients have to be within 125% of poverty. And that means for a family of four, about $40,000. And we find people who are just on Social Security who may be over income if they're the only person in their household. So we're talking about people who really had nothing and we were able to save and gain this property for them. So we're very uh, pleased with our project. Um, one of the things that we do with our project too though is that we do um, wills and estate planning so that families don't have these kinds of situations. Um, actually those documents will be going up on our website soon so people can do them themselves if they want to. And I do have a grant that funds that particular uh, activity without any income guidelines because we think it's just so important. You get families saying, well, uh, if I die, the property's gonna go to my husband, I'm not worried about it. Well, the truth is in Texas, and a lot of people don't know this, if your spouse dies and they had children that were not your children, they had children from another marriage, or outside of the marriage for any other reason, then those children get your spouse's half of the community property. So the home is not necessarily your home. It's only gonna be your home if all the children that deceased person had were your children as well. A lot of people don't realize that. It's a lot of, we get a lot of, uh, you know, grandmother wanted this house passed on to the children and the grandchildren. And so they're just doing that. Um, and people not realizing that they are uh, getting a tax bill and uh, things are being deteriorated. And so sometimes it's actually in people's best interest to just sign over their interest to the property. So we give that kind of advice and we try to be, uh, help people to be proactive as well as solving their immediate legal decision, uh, legal dilemma. Yes, sir. Does, does law uh, <clears throat> prevent them from signing it over until the, the lien has been clarified? I mean, uh, has been cleaned up, has been cleaned up or can they? They can sign it over before it's been cleaned up. Yeah. Um, but the problem is it's not going to mean anything to the people they're dealing with. It's not going to mean anything to the county. Uh, it's not going to mean anything to a title company if they're looking at the property. Uh, they have to have it cleaned up first and then the deed. But I mean, you can sign a deed at any time. I can sign a deed that says I give you whatever interest I have and have no interest. But um, it's that... Right. Yeah. It just stops the meter from running going forward. I'm sorry? It stops the meter uh, from going forward, the liability of the taxes that are due. The tax? So that pro rata share has been due to somebody else. Or the, tax, uh, in, the tax office may go back two years and look at that, but they're not going to care about that deed either until they have the uh, paperwork to show where the actual in interest was. So they still, you may have signed over a deed and filed in property records, but until it's clear that you had an interest, then the, the uh, tax office is still gonna be presuming you are an owner who is responsible for your portion of the taxes. So when you do a probate, you'll eventually get some kind of order from the judge or uh, let us testamentary, depending on what type of probate you have set up. Um, and that'll take care of that issue. If, if a person dies without a will, you can declare heirship and or you can do a monumental title on the will. That's a quick order. But there's going to be something. Um, without a will, there's what's called an affidavit of heirship. There's going to be something that says who the real owners are. So until whoever you're dealing with, uh, taxing authority, judge, whatever, um, until they see that you have an interest, the fact that you drew a deed is not going to necessarily mean anything up until that point. Makes sense. Yes, sir. What do you think about websites like LegalZoom to help people set up wills and so forth without an attorney? I feel sorry for people who pay for those services, to be quite honest with you. Um, 
and also legal zoom the paperwork you can pick up at office depot all those things those are general forms in texas we have a whole estate code that's about this thick and it's got specific rules and so there is a way uh, that people are to have it witnessed. There's paragraphs that have specific wording in Texas that have to go into a will. And uh, when I first started uh, law school, or I was pre-law, I bought one of those programs uh, so I can start doing documents and things, and I still found out it was worthless. So if it's in Texas, and I think if you go next time you're in Office Depot, pick up one of those packets and look on the back, it will probably tell you, because there's been so much pressure, it will probably tell you this is not state specific. You need to check your own state laws. Ouch. <laughs> okay, please. I want to just mention one thing about it too is uh, written will has to be totally in your handwriting. You can have it notarized, but I've only seen one situation where I thought a, a written will was appropriate. And that was my, my uncle was actually on his deathbed, and uh, he wanted to will his interest in the house to his wife. And so he wrote it all out, and, you know, literally within hours he was gone. So it looks like uh, we would have brought somebody in with a will typed up had we had time to make it. But the handwritten well was sufficient without, a, you know, without us being allowed the time to put it together. And then, uh, my, you know, even my own mother, I've told you I've been an attorney for over 20 years, my own mother will not uh, drop a will. I've had my staff contact her and say, look, you do it, it's confidential with them. And uh, what she told me is I had a will done a lot of years ago and any time I get mad with you, I just scratch your name out of it and I initial it. <laughs> that does not work. If it's written and typed, it's not going to be valid in Texas. It has to be notarized. But if it's, it's if it's on your own handwriting, it does not have to be notarized, but it can be notarized, which is new. It can be notarized, and that just it's kind of extra little safety if the family wants to fight it. Uh, but there's been some changes too, even if it's typed up, there's been some changes about the language to put in there so that there's something called self-proving affidavit and a specific language from Texas state code. And if you put that in there, then your family can probate your will without having to track down your witnesses. If you don't have it in there, they may have to track down your witnesses and then your will may fail if they can't find the witnesses. Yeah. There is a, a set of legal forms and things to assist you, and those are supposed to be state-specific. Do you know anything about those? I have used some, uh, but not in the probate arena, so I'm not sure when it comes to probate and estate planning. Uh, but I have used some of the quick forms for general transactional things. But uh, if you do, be sure and look and see if they ask you what state you're in. And not just because they want to put a state in there, but the selection should be early on so that they know we have to use these other provisions. But I wouldn't trust it. And there are a lot of uh, websites now, like I told you, uh, I'm about to put up on my office's website. Uh, Will, we also recommend the uh, Directed to physician, uh, durable uh, power of attorney for health care, uh, durable power of attorney for your finances, um, a authorization for appointment to take care of your remains, uh, uh, a declaration of guardianship in the event that you become uh, disabled. And uh, so there's about seven documents. Do you all know about the state planning documents, or would you like me to speak briefly? Okay, so we're familiar with the directed to physician or living will is what it's called. And what that is, is you decide that there are certain things you don't want anybody to decide for you. Your decision is, I don't want to be put on a feeding tube, or I don't want to be put on a ventilator. 
then you tell everybody, the doctor, your family, everybody, those are things that you do not want. You can also put in there things that you do want. For example, maybe you're having, uh, maybe you have a diagnosis of cancer and you're deteriorating, but the doctor says that there's this experimental drug that may be coming up and you want them to try that before they uh, give up on you. You can even do that. But that tells people exactly what you want. Now, the medical power of attorney is where you turn it over to somebody else to make the decisions. So those two can work together. So you can appoint your spouse or your child, whoever you want, to make decisions in case you become incapacitated. But you can limit their decisions by your living will. So that's how the two of those complement each other. Yes, sir. Have you seen this mess that was in the Houston Press? Uh, it started out in the Houston Press yesterday about the guy selling real estate that was slightly weird. No. <laughs> read it, people. You can get terribly confused, but read it. Okay. Somebody's found a way to use, uh, what do you call them, real quick, uh, Quick claim deeds? Well, he, he's selling stuff that is defective, but he's managed to get away with uh, getting his own liability on it. I have to look at it. Thank you, Yes. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, one, could you comment on uh, the forms put out by NOLO Press? And secondly, could you tell us a little more about the Earl Carl Institute in terms of how it's financed, how many lawyers you have on staff, whether you uh, uh, get any any uh, money from fees in, involved in cases that you might win? Sure. Um, your first question, Nolo Press, I wouldn't do it. Um, they're probably one of the better ones, but I wouldn't do it. Um, it's just the way things change in each state and everything that uh, I wouldn't rely on that. Um, then the next question, okay, the Earl Carl Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, our primary financial support comes from Thurgood Marshall School of Law. Thurgood Marshall School of Law pays my salary, the salary of all uh, upper management at the Institute, which we have three associate directors um, that work in addition to me, and um, all of our students. We get about uh, 16 students per semester to work with us. Approximately six students work in our clinical programs and the other 10 actually work with us on research and writing. So we do research and writing in a number of areas, but it's primarily housing, criminal justice, um, and education. And what we do with those positions is uh, we look at issues that are either upcoming in the legislature or that they're reviewing during the interim session, or that's just a hot topic. Or we may even be contacted by an attorney or an organization asking, um, if we would be interested in doing research on a particular issue. So we do that, we do, um, and typically what we end up with is a white paper or a policy paper that we share with other organizations who may be interested in the issue and also that we try to share with offices of elected officials. Um, as far as the clinic students, uh, they are supervised by this, this property clinic. Uh, the students are supervised by two attorneys we have one attorney in our juvenile clinic. We have one attorney in our Innocence Project. Uh, but the Innocence Project is a course at the law school. And so we average about 10 to 12 students in that clinic. Okay, Al, can you please uh, go over the process when you file a lawsuit against one of the heirs who's not paying taxes how do you dispossess him from the property, especially if the other heirs do not want to assume his tax liability? So mm -hmm. how, how does that process work, please? Okay, I'm gonna answer your question, but please remind me to go back and finish talking about the state documents, because I'll forget. There is something in the Texas Property Code that's called a Chapter 29 suit. And that's exactly what that suit does. If somebody has been paying taxes, they can file under Chapter 29. Um, that's the suit I was telling you about with 70 some odd uh, defendants. Um, and those people can be forced to sell their property. 
and uh, the court is supposed to use an appraiser, come up with fair market value, <clears throat> subtract the taxes that that person owed, and then that's the amount of money that the person who has been paying taxes has to pay the other heir for their share of the property. So it's called a Chapter 29 suit. Any other comments or questions? Okay, we yeah. have a couple here. Yeah, it was in the newspaper recently that uh, there's police departments all over the country that are uh, taking away people's property, forfeiture laws, I believe. They take their cash, they take their cars, sometimes even their homes, alleging that <coughs> this property was involved in the drug trade. And a lot of times the people are never even charged with a crime or they are not convicted with a crime, but they keep this property. That seems very, very unfair. To me, they should have to... Um, return the property if there's no conviction. Have you ever helped anybody in that type of situation? We have not, uh, and this is a partial answer. This property program is completely funded by grant from the Texas Access to Justice Foundation, and they only fund civil legal projects. And fortunately, it may be civil, but it's more connected to criminal, so it's not anything directly that they think, you know, should be a priority uh, for civil legal services. I understand from my other attorneys that if you take somebody to um, what the, the smallest court, what is that called? The small claims court or just Small the claims court, court, yeah. And you win, they say you still will probably never collect your money that you win. <laughs> Tell us about that. Um, uh, we call that being judgment proof, which means that you have no assets um, that the, that the uh, state or actually the county seizes assets for a person who get, gets a judgment, um, but you have no assets that are not exempt from judgment. So, for example, you can have one car per adult in the house. Um, you can have your house. Um, typically, it takes, you. if somebody has a bank account, you can probably garnish the wages, but it really takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to do that. So people who really don't have any kind of uh, assets, savings, um, you get to keep the tools of your trade, so many farm animals if you're on a ranch. Um, and so most people, if they didn't pay you, they probably don't have anything. And so you have to renew your judgment every 10 years, basically hoping that they hit the lottery. <laughs> Now, a couple of years ago, I had Memorial City Mall had my car towed off. I was parked up on their property next to a curb, but they said it wasn't a parking area. So my car was towed off. It cost me over $200 to get it back. I felt like suing them about that. Do you think I would have had a chance of winning a case like that? I don't know. Honestly, I can't speak to that. You're a, uh, this. Is it the Earl Carl Institute that's the 501C? Yes. C could you explain that? And do you charge fees for your services there? We do not charge any fees for our services. All of our uh, clinical services um, are provided through programs that receive some sort of a appropriation or a grant. And so um, everything is free of charge. But like I said, our grant requirements for just this one program restricts it to people who live within 125% of poverty. Well, for example, the grants that we have gotten over the years to operate the juvenile project. Um, I had one client who um, the dad made a quarter million dollars a year. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter on those other two. It's just on the property project. So what is a 501c exactly? We are um, exempt from taxes. We're a nonprofit. Um, and basically there's about seven categories that you can be in in terms of what you do to be a 501c3. Um, and one of the main categories is education. So uh, we do education work, we do public service, community. We do a lot of community events, uh, community education pieces. And um, you can't make over a certain so, amount of money, so we don't make any money. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's 125% of poverty, which I say for like a family of four is about $40,000. That's the max? Mm-hmm, that's the max. I think for one person it's like 
The eleven thousand dollars sum is very low. It was like twenty five. Well, you don't help people that make more than that. Right. From that particular program, we can't. Yes. What do you do if you have a lawyer who is an heir to an estate, and he won't pro didn't pro bother to probate all the wills? Then you need to file something um, with the court. Uh, it's called a motion to produce the will. And anybody who may be an heir to uh, uh, some property or assets that was left by the deceased, uh, you can file that motion. It's called a motion to produce the will. There's been any deterioration in the asset value. Mm -hmm. Yes, and generally what they do, um, first thing they'll do is remove them as executor. Yeah. And you can, uh, you can uh, request to be appointed as an executor. Would you repeat that exact phrasing? It's a, you mean motion to produce a will? Okay, that was the exact phrase. There wasn't any Latin in there anywhere? No. Okay. <laughs> but I did also say uh, you can ask for appointment for you to be appointed as the executor. Is there a time limit? Noticing your, your There's uh, a time limit for filing a will, which is four years, unless you can show good cause. And then if you can show good cause, there's a, there's a uh, proceeding called a muniment of title, and it has certain qualifications in it. Um, and if you meet those qualifications, that's when a court can probate a will beyond four years, but it, it's, Four years. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's the fraud involved, right? Uh, they didn't probate the whole thing. There were other parts of it. If it's still open. Yeah. You know, if it closes, that if, it closes uh, if they opened it for probate and it closes, uh, then you, you're going to have a very hard time doing anything else. But usually it takes a few years to close. I was noticing on your uh, dedication to the Innocence Project here, something that happened here a couple of years ago it was a different location, but somebody came from the prosecutor's office and I was having difficulty. I'm going to give you my take on the issue, which probably is not exactly right, but there was an apartment complex and the apartment manager didn't like the guys sitting around on their uh, hoods of their Toyota smoking grass and whatever. And, so he called the police department. The police department didn't seem to be interested. The prosecutor figured out that she had a way to go in and get injunctions against these people. Yeah. Okay, and it seemed to me just a blatant mechanism of just avoiding all of civil, uh, you know, requirements as far as criminal uh, process. You know, you didn't get a coin point court appointed attorney. You didn't get uh, innocent until proven guilty. I mean, they would just throw this stuff at these people. It looked to me. And uh, by taking, you know, and I'm sure they, the, the, they were probably ne'er-do-wells in most of our, our concepts, of, you know, but suppose they had a part-time job and they were paying some money to the mother of their child or whatever. Now they're taken and thrown out of the apartment and seems to be no legal uh, protection at all. I'm wondering whether you even, you're talking about uh, having the uh, certain restrictions on what you can assist with. Uh, have you ever gotten involved in anything like that against a city or... Uh, county prosecutor or whatever for just blatant violation and circumvention of criminal process? We have not. Um, however, uh, there are a number of issues like that. There are like thousands of issues like that when it comes to the criminal justice system. And so we take on um, trying to educate the public, the judiciary, attorneys, um, elected officials on some of these issues by putting together position papers, but we only have the capacity to do maybe six a year, uh, but they're very thorough, and we have seen changes made on some things that we've done. And, and you say no guilty until proven innocent. I went in one court representing a juvenile, and the judge actually said, as he was speaking to the whole group, um, you are guilty until you prove to me you're innocent. I'd rather not say. Is he still around? I still have to practice. <laughs> yes, sir. That is one of the problems that lawyers have is if they really tick off the judge, <laughs> things can get very, very, very 
they can end up with a practice that just isn't worth anything. Okay. Uh, have you ever run into a situation where uh, a piece of property is, uh, is left by the deceased? Uh, none of the heirs want to actually live there, so there's a provision for the house to go into trust and get rent and then distribute. They can set that up as a group by agreement. It's called a family settlement agreement if you do it through the courts. Um, they can do it as an informal agreement between themselves. Or what typically happens is uh, they may want to do a partition suit and force the sale of the property. So if everybody agrees, they can keep and set it up however they want. They want to make a formal agreement. Like I said, it's called a family settlement agreement. Um, they can do an informal agreement to rent the property out. But if, if everybody's not in agreement, uh, even if it's one person who's not in agreement out of several of the heirs, they can file a partition suit. And if the property can't be divided, if it's not large enough to be divided and give everybody their own share, then the court will order it sold. Do you, have you ever set up one of these trusts yourself? I haven't. I, I'll be honest. At this point, I uh, mainly supervise the attorneys who do that. Do you have, does the Earl Carl Institute work on um, political activism? That was the flyer you talked about, talk about. We do not do political activism. We do education. Um, sometimes it, it may sound like activism. I understand that's a <laughs> one, two, three thing, but do your students are they interested in that public policy? Our students are, and, I, and I'm very proud of that. Um, I think the things that we do and the issues that we talk about, um, they, do, they do touch our students, and many of our students go into public interest or into uh, legislative work um, because they have such a passion for what's going on. And I'll just give you an example of, of a one of the things that we did last month, we did a program called The Shooting of Michael Brown, Now What? And the question was not to be volatile or anything else, but it was the question of how do we as people of color come together and decide what we need to do so that we don't have those situations. And so now we've been contacted by the Department of Justice, and, and in the near future we're going to be doing a program on how the police should respond whether you want to look at militarization of police or community policing. And so we're involved in issues that are hot topics, but our purpose is to uh, kind of show both sides, uh, bring the issue to the community, and uh, to educate those people who really can make a difference in, in how things happen. Yes, sir. Yes, I did. Okay. Um, I think we got through the direct to physician and medical power of attorney. There is a durable power of attorney. That durable power of attorney is in the property code. And all you have to do is copy it word for word and insert the name of the person that you want to, to take care of your, uh, financial, your financial matters. Um, and, and there's about 20 items. You can select what you want and select what you don't want. Maybe you don't want them to be able to make gifts out of your bank account, or you don't want them to be able to sell your property. You can mark all that off. The person who's designated as your agent on your, your uh, it's called a du statutory doable power of attorney is technical name, but it's basically your financial power of attorney. does not have to be the same person who's on your medical power of attorney. For example, I have a sister um, who is very business-like. She takes care of all my brother's businesses. Financial, she takes care of getting things done on time. Uh, my father named her as the agent for his financials. Then I have two brothers who are doctors. They were named as agents for his medical. And then um, there's something called uh, authorization to dis appointment to dispose of remains. And that's the person who you want to take care of your funeral arrangements. And in that, you can let them know whether you want a traditional burial, you want to be cremated, all the way to what dress you want to wear and what song you want them to sing. And 
so the family is not bickering between themselves about how things are going to go, what's going to be done. You can leave it to one person. Uh, that has to be notarized. Um, then we have a guardianship for your children where you can appoint somebody. If the, if the other parent is not able to be the guardian, then you can appoint a person and designate who you would like to be your child's guardian. The same thing with uh, a, uh, you can do a declaration of guardian for yourself. So the medical power of attorney will kind of let people make decisions, but if some, for some reason one is not done or one is challenged to be invalid or something, you do have to get a guardianship. This will give you an opportunity to name who you want. And you can also name who you don't want. So you can put who you want, and you can put little Johnny down as I don't want because little Johnny never came to see you during your life. Um, now I'm trying to think if there's... What's the uh, appointment, appointment to dispose of remains. Yes. Along that same line, I've got a current situation. I, I do the state planning for myself and for clients. And uh, one thing that you've got to prepare for is what, what happens when the trustee or the person, the guardian that you've named, can't perform the function or is not performing the function as you have asked him to do. The, the current client has a brother and a sister that were um, that are the trustees on a uh, life insurance trust. So while it's not the same, it, it kind of flows in with what you're what I'm I'm saying. That you have to prepare to remove somebody in case they're not doing the uh, the, the the job that they were hired to do or asked to do. What happened is the one of the brothers and sister went into the house and started taking things out of it. Uh, that was the mother's, and she's currently alive. Well, that's a problem. They got into a family squabble, now they're not talking. So what he needs to do right now and what he has done is he's removed one of the, the trustees. You can't do it, that person couldn't do it, but the other trustee can remove the opposite. And it can be built into the language, but it, it all gets kind of complicated and you do need an attorney if, you're getting in, if you start getting into a, a large asset situation, so. Yes, yeah, so and you should name alternatives, even though you have one person you really hope will be a preference and they'll, t they'll take care of everything in your will and your powers of, of attorneys. Uh, you need to name one or two alternates to serve in case there's any problem. The other thing I want to mention before I forget is the best thing to do is to set up your assets to the extent possible to where you don't need to probate anything. So what I mean by that is your bank accounts, make them pay on death. Just tell the bank, I want a POD account. Or to a trust. Or to a trust. Yeah. Um, but if you just want to leave, you know, some money to somebody uh, and you don't need to have anybody administer it, you can make an account POD and then they don't have to go through probate or anything. Right. They just take your death certificate to the bank and they show it to the bank, and the bank right then and there will transfer the money to their, their name or give them a cashier check. Okay. Same thing. Yeah. Yes, it. it's called okay. POD. And the same thing with designating beneficiaries. If, if a beneficiary changes, I mean, a beneficiary is no longer the person you want to give your life insurance or your retirement, change those. Those things will go through a beneficiary. Really, if you do it very well, the only thing that you may have to administer would be uh, real property. Yes. I, I just want to emphasize to everyone what you said earlier and what Malcolm was saying, that uh, these things are very important for everyone. You may get along with your siblings, your children beautifully upon death it becomes a whole different world mm -hmm. it is amazing how people change in that kind of situation and people do things that their brothers and sisters would never have dreamed they would do it's it's sad but true it's absolutely incredible mm -hmm. the things that will happen I got one. Well, mm -hmm. Yeah. $24 million. Yeah. Well, I'll be honest with you. Uh, my father was well off, 
and he left a good bit. And most of it was pay on death, but there was some that was left so we could take care of whatever needed to be done with the estate uh, without having to worry about taking anything out of our pockets. And it was beautiful. It was beautiful in his last days. It was beautiful as we planned his going away ceremony. We walked through our childhood home together and videotaped and shared memories. Um, and then when it went to the probate phase, I don't think you're counting for everything. Well, I, I want the extra penny. And it was just, you know, and uh, we were so close, I never would have, you know, dreamed that some hurtful things were said in aftermath. They're fine now, but initially they were. And that's what my father was uh, very well organized. We knew how everything was supposed to go. Um, he made sure we knew how much money we were getting, just the pay on death. He made sure we knew what we were going to administer in court. Uh, very bright. Everybody knew what was what, but that didn't stop people from feeling like, oh, maybe somebody's keeping something from me. Or a pet. It's it's just incredible. A little bit uh, different subject here. Uh, partly thinking that you seem to be probably experienced with some much older neighborhoods. Uh, and I've, I have a neighborhood that was uh, subdivided in 1954. And the heritage around the neighborhood is that the the man who uh, subdivided what had been uh, uh, rice uh, fields had uh, tried to give the, uh, the uh, uh, right of way this 60-foot uh, uh, wide uh, parcel to the uh, city of Houston, and they wouldn't accept it. And instead, they wrote out something, I, I can't even really figure it out, something kind of like a joint ownership, if you will, between the, the um, city and the uh, uh, association, whatever. So we'd, we had originally, uh, uh, actually it was a gravel road originally and ditches and that was it and people had their own driveways then eventually the city came in and replaced the uh, streets and uh, driveways that was public works did it that was our driveway and then we voluntarily agreed to uh, to uh, have sidewalks put in um, it's in our deed restrictions that it's subject to and forever it looks like subject to the uh, uh, state code of uh, transportation of 1953 or whatever, which I don't believe included any sidewalks. And yet now the city has come and said that they, or Houston Parking Management has said they have a different definition, and that's now the, the um, sidewalk and not the driveway, which according, which would be according to the, uh, uh, you know, the building uh, department or whatever. Um, and so they can just give us a ticket. So they give us a ticket, gave me tickets, a variety of them for uh, parking in my own driveway. I go into court. There's no, there's nobody accusing me, uh, other than the judge. There's nobody to cross-examine. There's no evidence that I had ever blocked anybody from anything or broke any law. It seems to me it's a criminal violation if I'm told that I have, uh, you know, interfered with somebody's uh, rightful passage across my property, which I did not do. They did not present any evidence that I did. And yet they're just uh, all of it. And then they say, well, I don't get a jury trial according to my demand um, because it's civil. I, I, it makes no sense to me at all, but they apparently don't have to make any sense out of it. So I'm just wondering whether uh, uh, it seems also I, uh, part of what it occurs to me uh, in probably some, um, you know, something in common with, with some of the things that you deal with. It, it seems to be the attitude of the city. Well, if it was done 50 years ago, it just doesn't count anymore, period. You know, so it doesn't matter what it says or what you agreed with or that 2,000 lawyers have written off on this in, in terms of the uh, time that the subdivision has been there, but they just can come up with new rules and enforce them. You have a question? <laughs> yeah, why don't I get a jury trial? Um, why I, I'm accused of, of doing something wrong. I demand a jury trial, and I don't get one. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> that may be some sort of special provision, but in Texas, most everything, you're entitled to a jury trial. And I've had people call me from other states and say, do y'all really give a jury trial for this? And the answer is yes, in most cases, you are entitled to a jury trial. So I, I, I'm not sure, but I did. I have heard of that uh, situation. 
I thought it was a criminal charge, but criminal and civil, most times you are entitled to a jury trial. A criminal, you, you know, we know, but even in civil, uh, for example, in family law cases, uh, most of the states now do not do uh, jury, jury trial. But I live in the uh, Woodland Heights, and <clears throat> one of my neighbors told me that they had parked, uh, you know, tried to end the drive and got some sort of ticket or something for blocking the sidewalk. So it, I don't know. It, it is a city ordinance, and okay. you cannot block the sidewalk, so there's really, you can't prove anything else. It, it, it is the law. And, and it's a, when you're accused of violating the law, you're supposed to be subject to due process, and they, they have not uh, been at least been interested in providing it. I, I think in that uh, case, you're just going to have to sue. Mm -hmm. You can sue and, and ask for a court trial at that yeah. point. I, I have a question. What you happens? You know, typically, even if it's low level, you have the ability to appeal it to a higher court. And the higher courts are typically courts of record with juries. Um, and courts of record means that they actually take down evidence that can be reviewed by another court. Those lower courts, justice of peace, municipal courts, uh, most of the time there is no record. And so, um, you know, most of our justice of the peace are not, not even attorneys. But there, there is no uh, formal record to take up on appeal. So when you appeal the case, you just start all over. But there's not anybody to tell the first judge you did wrong. You know, don't do this again, because the the judgment may reverse. But um, in the in the higher courts, when they reverse the judgment, they explain what the judge did wrong. But in these cases, they never say what the judge did wrong, because it's all new. Once you appeal it, it's all new trial. Um, the question is, what happens to deed restrictions when they expire uh, for a subdivision when there aren't enough heirs? that live around that legally can renew them? Uh, do you go through this process? Does everything become unrestricted? I'm not sure, and the reason I'm gonna say that is because there's been a lot of changes in the law um, in the last few years. And the last time I did a deed, restruct, uh, deed restriction case was in 2009. Um, and I would say if they didn't renew, then uh, the uh, deed restrictions would go away back then. But things have changed. Uh, there's been some movement that's favorable to um, homeowners, but there also has been additional movement favorable to homeowner associations, or what they're more commonly calling them property owner associations. So uh, I just don't have enough insight into what some of the changes may have been to answer you. Do you ever deal with uh, issues concerning the City of Houston Neighborhood Protection uh, uh, agency which uh, can get rather heavy-handed and gets involved in neighborhood uh, fights sometime? No, I haven't. I'd like to talk a bit about uh, the benefits of, me, of people dying intestate. <clears throat> Years ago I was involved with an effort to preserve the Fourth Ward which had a lot of uh, black owners uh, and, and the descendants of those owners and they had never uh, sorted out who owned what in the later uh, generations. And so when the city of Houston began to make, uh, take steps uh, to uh, change the fourth ward and uh, push out the people who lived there, the fact that they had these unsettled estates worked to the advantage of the people who were renting those houses. And the city solved that problem in part <coughs> by commissioning a, a, a private nonprofit organization and giving it some money to go out and, and buy the property from the owners. And uh, <coughs> the fellow in charge of that was actually would threaten eminent domain mm -hmm. and to force the landlords to cooperate. And so they were able to solve some of the, uh, the ownership issues um, by uh, at least a threat of eminent domain. And the city of itself was very aggressive with the use of the building code uh, to force those owners to sell because they couldn't afford to charge their tenants what it would cost to uh, be reimbursed for any repairs they would have to make. Mm -hmm. So the, the fourth floor was actually protected by uh, those, there, the several problems they had uh, with uh, ownership in the fourth ward. Well, do we have any more uh, comments or questions? I, I think we have two quite minutes left, and I guess we do not. I want to say. Oh, we have another question. Jimmy. Have 
Have you ever charged the police with police brutality on any of your people? Uh, we have not, but we did issue in October 2013, we issued a report on HPD and their inactions in, in the community. And we specifically examined uh, racial profiling, which they have to file that data every year with the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement. Um, we looked at tasering and we looked at uh, excessive force. And in terms of racial profiling, of course, African Americans and to a less extent uh, Hispanics are stopped more often and they are more often to agree to a search. And so those who agree to a search, about 50% get arrested. Have you ever worked with Juan on any of his protests? No, I haven't. Okay, well, I think, uh, I think we're done. I want to say thank you very thank much you. For, for coming here. I, I didn't expect to have so many questions dealing with uh, probing, but it uh, turns out we have a lot of questions. Okay, next week, we'll, we won't be here. It'll be the Thanksgiving weekend, and the following week, we'll have our last meeting of uh, 2014. Very special presentation by a fellow who represents an energy company that is fighting a decision of the state of Texas to authorize a transmission line, I think a $500 million transmission line, to be paid for by ratepayers <coughs> to come into uh, the Houston area to deliver more, pro more power for the peak a point that those moments of peak demand. This power provider and, a, and another competitor both say they can handle it. They don't need to have another uh, uh, more energy coming into the Houston area. They can provide the energy that's needed. Fascinating topic because in part it's based on a computer model, which as we now come to know is more and more at the basis of the growth of government and our tax burden. So I hope to see you in two weeks. Thank you very much. Happy Turkey Day. <laughs> Six months to investigate a complaint in jail, but you know, I got 30 days to.